Hi everybody and welcome to a job number 49. Uh, I'll just get right into it. I wanted to take a little bit more time to cover some of the information that I have about or that I've gathered about life on other planets and mining operations on the moon and testimonies of people who I deem credible. I will take a minute or two towards the end of this video if I remember to answer some questions and comments that I've been receiving through email and through comments on the uh, Mr. Adam Josh YouTube channel and the a job channel that if you're on YouTube right now watching this that's the channel that you're on um, my stomach feels a little bit off uh, I think it's the combination of two things that I ate earlier um, sort of like a dairy product and a carbonated beverage sort of mingling so I'll probably keep it a, a little low and to answer one comment right away I won't be eating on uh, I won't be eating on this uh, episode. I may take a sip of this water, and that's about it. But uh, to answer your question right away, I suppose, why do I do that? Because that's my thing. I'm comfortable enough on camera that I can eat on camera and not be uh, self-conscious or not uh, care too much, I suppose. Not a lot of people can do that. I mean, that's my thing. You know, I, I started that uh, in Lunchtime with Adam years ago, blogging while eating, called uh, Lunchtime with Adam, LTWA. Look it up. <clears throat> Look it up sometime. I did a hundred uh, lunches. It was nothing really, just I mean, eating lunch and, and talking about my day. Instead of being at the desk that I'm sitting at now, I sat at that desk over there. <laughs> which uh, I still sat at, sit at every once in a while. I have two desks. Let's get right into this. Oh. <clears throat> because I'm incredibly in love with my own music, obviously, I had uh, further from this cage on. All right, so we're just going to sit back and listen to this for a minute or five. I ran into a real honest to gosh. This is John Lear talking. He's dead now, but he told me three things. And one was that we had been going to the moon since 1962, uh, that the, uh, the that the population of Mars was 600 million, and they looked just, just like us. And um, the other thing was that he had worked on a piece of mining equipment that was uh, to go to the moon. He said, John, he said, we built this thing down in Alabama, way out in the nowhere. He said, it was so enormous. He said, when we finished the project, he said, I actually rented a little airplane. He said, I'm a private pilot, and flew around this piece of equipment just to get an idea of how big it was. And I said, gee, that's fantastic. How did, how did they get it to the moon? Yeah. He said, I don't know. And that's, you know, the deal in compartmentalization. You get to know a little bit of the program, but you don't get, get to know the whole thing. So he knew a little bit, but he didn't know the whole thing. What an now, incredible... if you ask where the operations are from now and how they keep them so secret, I think it's Antarctica. Look at that picture that Clementine yeah. took in 1994. Can, can you imagine that we got a better picture of Aristarchus from a 10-inch telescope than Clementine did with a hundred million dollar satellite? Oh, that's great. I love it. It doesn't make any sense at all, does it? It does. So all this has been going on, you think, right under our noses for 40 years, John? Absolutely. Uh, if uh, anybody wants to uh, check uh, Google search words, I recommend two things. One is moon mining. You're going to be absolutely stunned at how much there is. I think there's a million five hundred thousand hits on moon mining and space law and Clementine. Just Google those things and see how much there is. They don't filter it. They just give it to the scientists. Okay. Here you and go. The scientists will then figure out. Wait a minute. This isn't bowlines, fireballs, asteroids, moths. You know. <laughs> this is uh, Richard Hoagland oh talking God. now. Richard C. Hoagland. These are spaceships. And 
They don't want the general Talking with George community, Marriott, which has incredible coast. credibility, hey, of course, if it ever came out with this, to have the source data to come to this conclusion. Let's see if it works hey, in Iran. We're going to see on Friday whether Ahmadinejad's days are numbered in Iran. Wouldn't it be interesting if behind the scenes, the geopolitics that we're not allowed to know are part of this, whatever's going on upstairs that we know is not using rockets, give me a break. NASA is not that obsolete. So then we look at this sudden order to keep scientists from accessing data, which is totally vital to keeping Earth secure, let alone the United States. The whole planet is secure because all it takes is one big rock and you had a very bad hair day. There's something on the moon that everybody now wants. Again, we're not supposed to know. A base that was built by the United States, the Russians, and the British, with the help of bankers, using technology that was given to this elite, this ruling family by the Greys in 1954. They've been up here a long time, and this is actually considered a resort. This is not Club Med. <clears throat> this area here apparently are, is a domed complex. That's uh, Jordan Inside Maxwell speaking. Crater, and I'm told that the world government picked this area because there's water underneath it. These are domes. These are a series of domes that are lit up from the inside. I want you to focus on this area right here. I want you to focus on this structure in here. For those of you who are architects, <clears throat> please feel free to, you know, say something about this. This area right here, you can see the curves, the angles. There's another bridge here. I want you to notice these lit up objects inside the bottom of the crater. We've got a close-up of it. Next slide, please. Here we go. Okay, here's another bridge. Apparently this is inhabited by extraterrestrials from Orion. These are, I'm told, are domes. Does everybody see this? Okay. I'm also told that this is a road that goes into here. There's an elevator that goes up to this area here. And when they land, they take an elevator or something down, and then they, they can walk, because there's atmosphere on the far side of the moon, which is why the astronauts took pictures of clouds. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, the snow job that we've been given. It's nothing what we've been told it is. Nothing. <laughs> right. Okay. Look at this. We're sitting there apart. This was taken by the Lunar Orbiter in 1966. Next one. This is seven miles high, and it's a monument to one of the old ETs. Next slide. Here's a close-up of it. Your suspicions are pretty accurate. Back up just one more time. Now let's look, now look, now just, you know, look at the rest of the terrain here, okay? Look at the rest of the terrain and just look at how this sticks out. Seven miles. How come our astronauts missed it? I mean, I hate to be redundant, but I'm just hoping somebody will have the answer. There are 35,000 full-time human beings from Earth living on the moon. And they are Aryans by birth. Now, let me just say that one more time. They are Aryans by birth. They are Aryans by birth. You're going to have to research one because if I come right out and say it, I'll get in deep trouble. This is why the focus is on destroying the United States of America. Okay, the UN, the World Order, all of that stuff, they're all taking orders from ETs, and they're scared to death. But they're willing to sacrifice this nation. They're willing to kill three and a half to four billion people to maintain their place 
as the new priesthoods. This is Sumeria, this is Egypt all over again, but on a much grander scale, because now you've got six billion people living here. That might not, not have been uh, Jordan Maxwell. Excuse me while I move this camera. <clears throat> Excuse me again while I put my feet up. Oh. So, let's wrap a little bit. Sorry, my stomach really does feel sort of ill. How much would it change your life to know for 100% that there's a population on the moon? I mean, what would change in your daily life? That was the first, the first thing that I faced when I started uh, researching, discovering this information. So, you know, when I found out about John Lear going public with all the information that he knows in the pre-1960s uh, and 70s NASA photos of the moon, um, what John Lear had done is he ordered all these photos from the moon, and his friends you know, ordered him all these photos from the moon. And this is before Photoshop uh, was being, an airbrush was being as prolific as, uh, as it was later. So some of these photos had like clear structures and he blows up these photos and shows them and has these gigantic photos of, uh, you know, from 1960s and earlier of the moon. And I myself went out even just with these, these small binoculars and looked at Aristarchus. And if you don't know what Aristarchus is, I suppose you could Google it or uh, when you look up at the moon at, the, at night, if you don't already know this, the moon doesn't have like a, a rotation like our Earth does. Our Earth is sort of always like moving in a rotation and orbiting around the, around the sun. But the moon stays still in a fixed orbit as a satellite around Earth, which is was a, a stunning revelation to me because I didn't always know that. And they call the side that's not facing us the dark side of the moon which is a misnomer because it's not actually dark i mean you can just theorize in your mind in your mind's eye the the idea of the moon going through space clearly it's seeing light on all sides and the sun my point was when you look at aristarchus it's this, it's basically that a gigantic glowing crater you can get a telescope and just zoom on the Earth because it's, it's, you know, the side always facing us. You'll see it. It's the it's the only gigantic crater on it that's glowing. I mean, initially, you know, of course, you got to ask yourself. The first thing is, what the hell? Why is that glowing? And it's not like glowing like reflection of the sun type, white, grayish glowing. It's glowing blue. In the crater. And I can look up at the moon on a clear night and see this glowing myself, just with crappy binoculars. So, as John Lear was commenting on, um, uh, he was commenting the same thing, that uh, this, uh, this person who used uh, this Clementine photos, the Clementine telescope to look at this, got a clearer picture than NASA brought back from Hubble Telescope, which is total bull, which means I've heard, you know, and I've heard that the, somehow the Vatican has the rights to all the images from the moon, or so the, all the images from space. I don't know how true that is, but I'm sure there's a handful of people or a handful of groups or families that own, you know, have copywritten the images from outer space. I mean, if, if there's three guys that can own the mineral rights for the moon, as I've covered on Helium-3 mining the moon, uh that it's not too far-fetched to think that there's people who own the physical images from outer space. There's people who, and you, you know, looking at that, you're probably like, how, how can anybody own the moon or own mineral leases or, but, uh, and it's hard to imagine, but 
it doesn't stop people from saying they, they own the mineral leases on the moon. It's sort of like first come, first serve. I, na I named it, or I, you know? So backing up, the first question you have to ask yourself is what changes in my day-to-day -day life when I accept this to be true or whether I at least accept the fact that I'm being lied to or that at least I can question what's going on on the moon and other planets. What changes in your day-to-day -day life when you look up at the moon and you stop seeing a lifeless satellite, you stop seeing a, a dead rock floating in space? What happens when you start seeing life in your mind's eye and in your imagination when you look at the moon? For me, that night that I sort of read all John Lear's testimony and looked at his website, um, I don't know if you know who John Lear is, but uh, like, you know, his, like I said earlier, his father invented the uh, the airliner and jet. John Lear himself has won more uh, like FAA designated awards for flying uh, than anybody else has in history. He's flown basically like every sort of uh, plane. He's worked for the government and worked for. Uh, airliners and somebody with a huge reputation like that you'd think would have a Wikipedia page but his dad does but because of the information that John Lear covers and went public with he doesn't even have a Wikipedia page all it says is that he's the son of William Lear so pretty clearly a lot as uh, he's got a lot on the line and uh, you know, now he's not so public with the information. Uh, you know, who's I don't know him personally, so who's to say why? But you can hear the way he speaks and uh, the evidence that he has, and uh, people like Richard Hoagland also back him up, and other people. So, and I mean, aside from all that, you have Abydos carvings in pyramids or old uh, ancient structures in in. Uh, in Egypt depicting flying saucers and I've talked to my friends in the southern United States who have been to Texas and uh, sorry been to Mexico and said that they've found pictures of flying saucers or carvings of flying saucers in Mexican pyramids as well and if you look online they're all over pyramids as well as carvings of flying discs and pictures depicting what look like astronauts and modern day vehicles and all that. So the issue of time travel is one that I've sort of covered before briefly, but uh, I think it's pretty evident when you look at just even the modern geopolitics of today that there's a group of families who are in power who are seen to rewrite history the way they see fit. And if you don't believe that, then all you have to do is take a short trip down memory lane and go back to WMDs in Iraq and there's you know people trying to sell you that like it was the truth or you know 19 Muslims armed with box cutters masterminded 9-11 you know six of which are still alive and, could, and went on you know the news to say that they were alive and you could find these people today so there's people that have created these fables and, and, and want to sort of make their own version of history and something that I've been thinking about lately is how, how controlling populations by limiting information. So if your only choices are Coke and Pepsi, you're sort of like, well, I have to choose Coke or Pepsi. This is your choices. Well, I guess I'll choose Pepsi. Well, I guess I'll choose Coke. So if those are your only two options, a douchebag or a turd sandwich, you know, it's a... Uh, Obama or whoever it was and or now it's going to be Rick Perry or um, Sarah Palin or whoever we'll see what happens right but limiting your choices and not even allowing the chance uh, you you control people's choices sort of by that so limiting your information about life on other planets or advanced space technology Tesla based weapons scalar weaponry John Hutchison uh, Edward Lee Scalin, Scalin is another one. J.P. Morgan uh, himself, you know, of the J.P. Morgan banking industry, sort of bankrolled 
a lot of Tesla's inventions and when he found out that Tesla was intending on building free energy devices that would channel energy out of the ionosphere, he sort of sidetracked all his all his uh, patents and inventions or whatever and Tesla died penniless and all these confidential patents and inventions of Tesla's it's not like they were just thrown out there's people that live you know their lives in skunk works and R&D departments advanced weaponry people who who live to have the cutting edge on technology so you know, we can see now that there's, you know, 3D television or holographic imaging. I've seen ho holographic images of Richard Branson. People think that, on the same topic, people think that going to space is like, so, f you know, some distant, oh, it's impossible. Um, but like Richard Branson is privatizing space flight, so it can't be impossible. And imagine with unlimited black budgets what you could do you don't want to believe the secret space program or Star Wars program are real, all you need to do is spend some time on the uh, information superhighway and you can convince yourself. I don't need to convince you. Again, backing up, sorry about my bunny trails. My stomach really does sort of uh, feel ill, by the way. But uh, next time, no ice cream and mixing carbonated beverages. So, backing up, what changes about your day-to-day -day life when you realize that you're being lied to? Well, I mean, we all sort of know inherently in North America that our government lies to us. We all sort of know that there's this military-industrial complex that views everybody as an enemy combatants, so therefore lies to the lies through the news. People like Rupert Murdoch. Um, with his Israeli Jewish connections, of course, are constantly lying through the news and disinforming the public so they can again control the decision making and create this make believe theater reality that uh, so many who watch t television day in and day out can somehow believe. It's a, it's a growing minority nowadays because of alternative news, so they'll clamp down on alternative news and the unmainstream, I suppose, or the other stream. But, uh, don't know where I was going with that one, but, you know, what changes in your day-to-day -day life? I was saying, you know, because you know that, pe the, that we live in a culture of sort of lies and disinformation. It's not so hard to believe. I didn't have sexual relations with that woman. I'll close Guantanamo Bay and bring our troops home and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we know that we're lied to, WMDs in Iraq and a mission accomplished with the Gulf of Tonkin, Pearl Harbor. We know that we live in a culture of government sponsored lies and disinformation. So when you extend that knowledge to things like outer space and our knowledge of what's on the moon or what's on other planets in our solar system or how are there people that look like us or even humans from this planet colonizing other other planets. One thing I had to actually ask myself and give myself some deep thought about was there's people uh, that, that aspire, aspire that you know one day uh, humanity our destiny is to, is to go to the stars and populate colonize space and, and you know travel like on Star Trek The Next Generation. Now we talk about like one day, one day that'll happen. But here's my question that I had to ask myself. If it already has happened, would you know? And does anybody really know what's going on in, in those secret space programs, aside from the people who are in them themsel themselves and the people they report to? I mean, it's not far-fetched for me to believe that there's a secret space operation that's been harnessing advanced technology for uh, decades and 
exploring space already and maybe even colonizing. I mean, how long would it take to colonize a small colony? So you take 20, 30 people, tell them, start having babies and might have a small city a few years later. If we've been doing it for decades, it's not too hard to believe that we could have colonies on other planets. The question would be like, would you ever know? And you sort of have to honestly admit, with the history and track record of our government, we probably would never know until it was sort of common knowledge. And then maybe they'd put like a blurb in like the bottom of a, of a news station, say, oh, by the way, we have a colony on space. Or, it's not like the president would come out one day or, or a, a prime minister or uh, and say, oh, by the way, we've been colonizing space. So questions to ask yourself or what changes in your day-to-day -day life when you realize or at least question or look at or at least think maybe there's more to this than I was originally led to believe. For me, like I was saying a long time ago, a few minutes ago, at first it was hard for me to, to sleep at night, you know, I kept thinking like looking up at the moon and thinking about other people looking back down at me. And then I sort of, you know, you wake up and you go about your day and you realize I still have to eat, I still got to go to work, the government's lying to me, okay, I already knew that, still got to, you know, pay your bills and do whatever you do with your daily life, family is still important, the government lies to you, your family isn't any less important because the government's lying to you or because we've colonized space already or because J.P. Morgan and his cronies decades ago uh, kept Tesla's technology away from you so he could profit off the sales of selling energy to you instead of seeing or realizing Tesla's vision of free energy from the ionosphere to the world. We've been living in a purposely controlled for-profit energy system for decades and if Tesla had his way none of us would be paying for electricity. I mean it's pretty common knowledge that the fossil fuel system is sort of outdated uh, and I mean I've been in the car industry, the automotive industry, one of the things that we do since I was 16, 17 years old. So it's something like I don't talk about a lot because it's sort of so familiar to me in the back, like I know it like the back of my hand, sort of a lot of the auto industry. Somebody asked me once how many cars I, they think I've driven. I did an average calculation, like say I've driven a thousand cars uh, a year since I've been in the auto industry. I've driven minimum over 10,000 cars in my life, high end, low end, and everything in between. And uh, that's that's a minimum ballpark. So when people talk to me about their cars and all that, I'm sort of like, eh, well, it's just a car, who cares? But I, I, at the same time, things like the Bugatti Veyron and, and uh, some really nice, I drove a BMW Z4 for a while, and uh, I like the old boxy Mustangs. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about anymore. But my point was about tires. I'm looking at uh, the Lincoln right now, and I'm looking at the tires, and I, I mean, I knew this 10 years ago, that tires uh, could be replaced if they didn't go flat, you know, and now they're coming out with, you know, run flat technology and all that, but you, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to look at a tire and think like, why do I have to always fill air in it? It's not like, or a bicycle tire, why do I have to have an inner tube? I mean, there's better ways to do this. See, they can make tires that don't go flat. They can make cars that run on water. You can see, look, you can go on, on YouTube and type in, uh, type in, uh, type in on YouTube vegetable oil diesel mod or diesel car running on vegetable oil. And you can see, guys, <coughs> vegetable oil, cooking oil, and they run their, their, they run their car on it. So it's not, it's not, it's pretty clear that we're being, sort of kept in this for-profit control system on purpose and probably I don't know as long as as long as we can so there's people who see themselves in you know powerful positions over us I think that's pretty self-evident people that consider themselves the elite of our social structure some people have theorized that these people are light years in advance or 10,000 years ahead of us technologically and of course, if they ever come down to mingle at our level, they'll never advertise that or publicly make spectacle of it. Maybe <laughs> until you see like uh, George Bush Sr.'s eyes clicking in the middle and two sets of eyelids blinking. You know, like what the hell is that? I don't know. Maybe he's got some 
advanced technology eyes that uh, we're just not privy to. I, I, who knows? David Icke would say he's a reptilian shapeshifter, or that's the uh, reptilian entity controlling him. Uh, I can't confirm or deny that. I don't know the truth. Whatever the truth is, I I'd side with that. So that's about as far as I want to go on today with uh, expanding your mind about life on other planets, mining operations on the moon, etc., etc. As far as questions and comments go, um, I answered the one about food already. Um, I had a, an email sort of asking me, um, if I can remember correctly, oh, asking me, uh, you know, why don't I keep everything on one channel? Uh, uh, that what? And the answer to that is, um, I do a lot of different things. And I try to keep some of what I do separate. Um, I've been into many and various and unrelated and different things throughout the years. And I've done different web shows. Excuse me for one second. Hello. Hey, what's up, bro? I'm just talking into a webcam. What are you doing, Rick? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was recording a, a blog or, for my website. What's, go What's going on? Yeah, I know. Alright, I'll, I'll talk to you later. That was my, uh, my bro, Rick Legacy lead singer of uh, Butterface and uh, Panic, one of the last bands I was in playing drums. So you know I do different things, put it that way, that's what we were talking about. You know I've played uh, drums in bands and uh, I play acoustic guitar, I've written my own songs and all that and I try to keep it from me sort of separate. I hope that answers your question. I mean the Adam Josh website is sort of the hub for all things that I do and uh, that's about that. If you want to send me any more comments or questions, I try to eat, answer them in the videos themselves, as you see, instead of commenting on people's pages or commenting, because uh, that can sort of be a tar pit trap, and I'm not trying to get anybody fighting with anybody, and I certainly don't want to uh, waste my time fighting with people. Uh, so if you have any questions or whatever, you can email me or leave me comments, but I'll answer it in the uh, videos themselves usually. So thank you for your time. Thanks for watching uh, the A job 49. I gotta take this call. So tell your friends to get a job.